The origins of the textile industry in the Rochdale area can be traced to the domestic manufacture of coarse wool and cloth in medieval times. Spinning and weaving in the home was combined with small-scale farming. As demand for wool and goods increased, production grew out of the small holding and into the mill, at first water-powered by the plentiful Pennine rivers, and then, from the end of the 1700s, powered by the steam engine. What was once a series of sparsely populated moorland settlements quickly developed into the most sophisticated industrial landscape the world had ever known. The Industrial Revolution was underway. The towns and villages that now form the borough of Rochdale would soon be transformed by the towering mill chimneys which until quite recently dominated the skyline like vast monuments to this once great textile industry. At this time, most of the raw cotton arriving in Lancashire had been grown by slaves on plantations in the southern states of America. From the end of the American Civil War in 1865 and the resulting abolition of slavery, the large-scale farming of cotton had spread throughout Asia, Africa and parts of Europe, wherever the correct climate and cheap labour coincided. Lancashire proved to be the perfect environment for the production of cotton cloth. The famously damp climate of the area made the cotton fibres less likely to snap during the spinning process. In addition, Lancashire had many engineering works to manufacture spinning and weaving machines and supplied its own coal to the boilers firing the mill engines. The region's long tradition of small-scale textile production meant that skilled labour was on hand. The development of the canal, road and rail networks helped to supply the huge amount of raw materials needed to keep the swelling numbers of mills in operation. The thousands of workers needed to keep the mill machinery going included children as young as eight. But in 1918, when full-time schooling was made compulsory, child labour was finally outlawed. From then on, most mill operatives started straight from school, aged 14, and could find themselves working on any of the different processes needed to produce cotton textiles. Well, I started work at 14 at Cotton Mill because round here, there's nothing else. You, you know, there were very few apprenticeships. Yeah. Your parents worked at all. You go in Mill and got your job and that really. You were in Cotton Mill. You know, train in them days, you had to go dive in, have a 14, and on that same, the, the following Monday, I must have been 14 with me, and on the following Monday, I had to go straight to work when I was 14 year old, and you never did any training or anything. You never, you just you were just thrown into it, and you had to fend for yourself. You never, never shown. You had to just watch what others were doing, and yeah, oh no, but I still have it. Never bothered. I'm more bothered about the lads. <laughs> Most people of my generation had to go in the mill because we weren't exactly really very educated. I just went to the central school in Littleborough. Uh, I came out of office work to go in the mill for the wages mm. because in the office I was getting like two pounds, two shillings and sixpence a week. And in the mill I got six pounds, I thought it was, you know, but my dad never spoke to me for about three months after. He didn't want to, they wanted something better for you, yeah. as they thought, yeah, you they see. Did. And um, my dad, he was very easy going, but I think it must be three months before he, yeah. he spoke to me, went mad. Mind. But he, he went for the money, you see. But uh, I think the first week I just worked and slept. I was that tired. Yeah. Well, my mother taught me to weave. I did 12 months with my father. He worked at the Eclipse Mill down Red Lane in a ring room. And I went working for him, sorry, in the card room. And I went working for him. I hated every minute of it. And then days you could go from one mill to another mill, giving notice Friday, start work the following Monday at another place. But you can't do that anymore. You know, but the mill round here, there was such a lot of mills. 
But my mum said come down to the weaving, but my mother was a hard taskmaster. She told me, Sorry. she told me that if I didn't learn in a week, I'd be off. And she made sure I learned. Um, my father had made her a reed hook with a wooden handle. And if I drew the ends in wrong, it came down on my knuckles. And I went home that first night with blue knuckles and my father went mad. He said, she, he said, she said, she'll learn. She'll learn. I'm telling you now, she'll be off my looms in a week and where I was running my own looms within a week. Within that week, yeah. Hard taskmaster. But I learnt. The process of turning raw cotton fibres into finished fabrics happened in three stages. Spinning, weaving and finishing. The tasks involved in each of these stages were specialist and labour intensive and the engineering genius of those that invented the machinery still boggles the mind today. So it was like a, a process that thinned it out until we got to the cotton stage, you know. Yeah. yeah. And then the mules, they actually put the twists in it to make it strong. And then you know, from, so weave it. from the yeah. spinning room it went to the winders. Mm. Then from the winders it went to the weavers. I was supervisor in the winding room and they called them cakes and they were round and you took them over a little pulley and then down and you made perns and then perns went in the shed to be woven now a manager then had to go through the mill he'd to be able to do any of those jobs he had to tell people how to do it, because he'd done it. He was so bored in them days, because it was so slow. There were two light, two bobbins. You put a bobbin onto that, one of them, and, and piece it up, and it was going that slow. You could get to the end before you started again. But uh, they speeded all that up, and it was a lot better. Oh, I've lived two, two world wars, yeah, yeah. We had to have blackouts and a lot of people were stopped because they weren't work, you know, for two shifts, they were on two shifts. And I know, <coughs> well, I, it's nothing to do with the workings really, but I did a man's job uh, when I worked at Carrington's during the war. Instead of working on the winding frames, I was, uh, I was able to take a frame down to nothing and put it up again. But I was taught how to do it. You have to be taught how to do things. There was two of us, another girl beside me that did it. And I might as well tell you that we did a better job than the men. In card room, when uh, on the intermediates, I went on intermediate, uh, when the bobbins were full, yeah, Oh, oh, that's how you carry the That's how you carry the combs off. To the, yeah. uh, speeds. We used to drop them in in a skip, uh, in a, a truck, and you piled them up one under your arm yeah, like that. Piled them up. Tub, and and you know, if I go like shopping a without a basket for a few things, I and still carry the shopping like that. Yeah. Didn't you? Yeah. Held, held them with your head. head.